Hello, Dr. Melanie Joy. Thank you so much um, for your time. We really, really appreciate this interview. First up, can you explain carnism to people that might not really know what that means? Carnism is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. So we tend to assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system when it comes to eating animals, but the only reason that most of us learn to eat dogs but not pigs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. Now, carnism is a, uh, a dominant belief system. That means it's invisible and it's woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it becomes internalized, shaping the very way we think and feel about eating animals. How does um, carnism differ to speciesism? Speciesism is the ethos or like kind of the meta-ism that enables carnism. So carnism you can think of as a sub-ideology of speciesism, like uh, anti-semitism is a sub-ideology of racism. They're structured in very similar ways. And why do you think recently people are becoming vegan more and more and um, why should other people adopt this lifestyle? I think more and more people are becoming vegan um, because it is more and more people are becoming aware of the reality of the atrocity of carnism. It's becoming easier and more normalized to become vegan. And more and more people are aware that eating animals is not necessary for survival or for health. In fact, it's you know, quite likely counterproductive. And I don't see this trend, you know, quote unquote trend changing, this trajectory changing. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that um, people are going to, the, the number of vegans is going to increase, the number of, the availability of vegan products is going to increase, and it's gonna be easier and easier for people everywhere to become vegan. Um, and I do think those skills are gonna tip at some point um, so that veganism becomes the dominant ideology. Do you think veganism is a, a social justice movement? Like what are the, obviously there's a lot of, a little bit of debate in the community about this. What are the similarities between veganism and like racism and sexism? And what are the differences? You know, the, each set of victims when it comes to oppressive systems or oppressive ideologies um, will always have unique experiences. We can't really compare, you know, racism with sexism, with speciesism, because there are many nuances with those. Um, or there are many nuances among the victims, the experience of the victims. However, all of these isms reflect um, or are made possible by a similar mentality. The mentality that enables sexism is not terribly different than the mentality that enables carnism and speciesism and all of the other violent isms. And so when we think about social transformation or social justice movements, it's important to not think about simply fighting for the rights of one group at a time. It's really not simply about changing behaviors, it's about shifting consciousness. What we're asking for with the vegan movement is for people to shift from a consciousness that embraces, um, you know, exercising power over others, comfort and convenience over authenticity and compassion. We're asking for people to change the way they think and change the way they relate so that their behaviors are more reflective of integrity and of core values of compassion and justice. And this is precisely what's being done with other social justice movements in many ways. We're asking people not just to stop thinking about one certain group of people a certain way. It's not just about one type of privilege. It's about how do we bring integrity into our lives and our world so that there are no victims who are seen as appropriate. One of your quotes in a, a recent speech was, pain is the mirror in which we can see the reflection of our humanity. What do you mean by this? Um, humans are hardwired to empathize with others and um, carnism conditions us to disconnect from empathy, our own empathy toward other animals. And empathy is our natural state. When we see animals suffering and we feel pain, that's a reflection of the fact that we do care. Carnism has taught us not to care, but on a deeper level, on a more authentic level, the vast majority of us do care about animals and we care about creating a better world for them. Most people, 
you know, would never willingly support intensive, extensive, and completely unnecessary violence to animals. Most people um, who were truly aware of not just animal agriculture practices, but of carnism would find this, would find the idea of eating animals deeply offensive. I know people that have watched documentaries like Earthlings and Cowspiracy, and then straight after watching the documentary, they've had like meat-based fry-ups. Like, as a psychologist, what is, what's up with that? It's entirely possible to look at something without actually seeing it. You know, when we watch violent movies or see violent reports on the news, most of us are compartmentalizing. We're not letting it go from here to here. There are a lot of reasons for this. Asking people to stop eating animals is not simply asking for a change of behavior. It's asking for a shift of consciousness. It's asking for people to be willing to become members of an ideological minority group. It's asking for people to perhaps ri risk relationships and connection in their lives. Um, I recommend asking people to become as vegan as possible. When you ask somebody or advocate that somebody become as vegan as possible, you're honoring the fact that they're the expert on what they are and are not able to do. do you, is um, veganism a moral baseline in your opinion? What do you mean by moral baseline? Well, what I mean by moral baseline is, like, I guess it's like a philosophical thing and you're talking about the, the psychology, but what I mean by that is like, if say you or somebody, a friend or whatever had to go up and themselves kill an animal, we'd all think that was completely wrong and we can see the moral baseline from that in that, you know, killing unnecessarily is completely wrong, but for some reason, as a community, when we try and promote veganism, that message becomes watered down and we say things like, oh, you know, reduce sectarianism is good and stuff like that. I'm just playing devil's advocate, but do you see what I'm, I'm trying to say? So I, I believe that when we advocate that, you know, you, either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. I think there's a lot of problem with that messaging. What we do is we alienate 98, perhaps 99% of the population from becoming supporters of this important cause that they may otherwise choose to support. Um, I've recently been talking about vegan allies. I write about this in my book. Vegan allies are people who are not vegan themselves, but who support vegan values and who use their influence to help further the vegan cause. So the meat-eating journalists who interview me and publish articles about transforming carnism and moving toward veganism that reach millions of people, or philanthropists who donate to our organizations, our organization and other organizations, vegan organizations, so that we have jobs and can do the outreach we do, are, when you look at just the numbers, are saving far more animals than a single person who's not eating them in a lifetime. By inviting people who are not fully vegan into the movement and allowing them to use their influence and support to further the movement, we are doing a tremendous amount of good for this cause. And I think by alienating those people, we're doing ourselves and the animals a significant disservice. Let's talk about Beyond Beliefs, your, your new book. What inspired you to write it? So for the past six and a half years now, I think, I've been traveling the world um, giving talks about carnism and also giving trainings and workshops to vegans um, and, and also sometimes vegetarians on effective communication and on uh, self-care. And what I've discovered is that thousands of vegans and vegetarians around the world have experienced, um, you know, becoming vegan is one of the most empowering choices that, that many people can make. And what often happens is that somebody becomes vegan and they're not prepared for the disruption in relationships that ends up following that. Um, people become vegan and they're excited and then suddenly they're met with this defensiveness. Um, and the people that they may once have been closest to don't understand their choice to be vegan. And um, suddenly communication and relationships can start to break down. And so as a psychologist, also as a longtime relationship coach and a person who's traveled to 38 countries now, speaking with vegans and vegetarians around the world, I realize that this problem of relationship breakdown and communication breakdown among vegans um, is a, a significant cause of suffering, just personal suffering. And it's also an obstacle to the growth, in my opinion, of the vegan movement. 
studies have shown that people who have uh, secure connected relationships fare better in every aspect of life. They live longer, they're happier, they're at reduced risk for uh, depression and anxiety, they're happier, um, and they're at reduced risk for disease. And they also have more career success. So you can imagine the impact of not only the absence of those connected healthy relationships, but the presence of disruptive ones. And so in my experience, I've seen a lot of vegans who have suffered at the loss of um, connection in their relationships and, and feeling unable to communicate about this very important issue in their lives to the people that are closest to them. Because of what you said, do you think misanthropy is a problem uh, in the, the vegan community? And if so, why? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what I've... Um, observed is that many vegans end up despairing, this frustration, this feeling like, you know, constantly being confronted with defensiveness, um, simply sometimes by saying, I'm vegan. People are met with defensive reactions. And many vegans who haven't been given the tools or the understanding of the psychology of, of eating animals, the psychology of carnism, um, and how to have a healthy relationship, essentially, it's become despairing and frustrated and misanthropic. We can also see a lot of infighting among vegans who don't have, um, haven't learned the tools to communicate effectively and compassionately across differences. I mean, it's most of us never have any training whatsoever on how to have a healthy relationship, how to communicate with people that we encounter in the world. And so most people struggle to have healthy relationships in the first place. But then when you throw, uh, a factor in like veganism and carnism, you know, which is a, a significant ideological difference between people. It can feel for some people almost unmanageable to, to talk about. But the good news is that with an understanding of the basic principles of how to have a connected, secure relationship and basic tools for effective communication, relationships, including friendships and acquaintanceships, you know, can become much more productive. Um, connections can deepen beyond what they even were before. And do you think there's any kind of correlation between activists, vegan activists burning out um, and um, them, you know, hating humans and misanthropy? Do you see there being like a correlation there? Absolutely. Um, you know, one hallmark of secondary traumatic stress, which is one of the main contributors to, to burnout, the stress that people experience when they're not direct victims of violence, but, but witnesses to um, violence. One of the hallmarks is uh, misanthropy, losing faith in humanity. And it makes total sense for vegans. You know, vegans, many people become vegan because they genuinely care. They make that connection. They want to make a positive difference in the world for animals and, and for the world. Um, and yet they're confronted with this defensiveness. They're confronted with this anti-vegan mentality in, in many instances or many, many experiences they have in their lives. And, you know, vegans work Vegan activists in particular work very hard to try to make the world a better place for animals and their efforts are often invisible at best and, and ridiculed um, or mocked. And so it certainly takes a toll. Being aware of the atrocity of what's happening to the animals in the world is a heavy burden to carry. It's important to have that awareness, um, but we need support to be able to do that work, to do the important work that vegans are doing in a way that's sustainable, that doesn't lead to misanthropy, anger, burnout, and, and infighting. And that was one of the main reasons that I wrote my book. I see people who have chosen this path of veganism, who are really pioneers in this social justice movement that's young and that is also really starting to transform the world doing the hard work that needs to be done and having to deal with the fallout of that choice and un unanticipated sort of fallout of the choice to become vegan. And I wanted to write a book that would support vegans so that they could um, communicate more effectively and cultivate relationships that help sustain them instead of draining them. People often criticize the vegan movement, suggesting we force our views on people and children in particular. What do you say to these people? So I, I write about this in my new book, the way that carnism distorts perceptions of control 
and distorts perceptions of opinions, for example. So uh, people who are, because carnism is the dominant system, um, the assumption is that anything that furthers carnism is either ideologically neutral or at least, um, you know, valuable. And anything that challenges it is the opposite. So for example, people will, you know, when it comes to, to talking to vegans about raising their children vegan. The assumption is that vegans are imposing their beliefs on their children. We don't make that same assumption about people who are imposing their carnism on their children. We also, most of us recognize that we raise our children to embrace our own beliefs. This is why we don't ask a Jew why they're not raising their child a Christian. Vegans are already a really, really small um, percent of the population. I think about 1% generally of the population. What do you think the biggest barrier to entry is for most people? It just it depends where they are in the world. You know, if you for some people, it's availability of vegan foods. Um, for other people, it's not having information about veganism. And for other people, they're living in a culture that is um, perhaps more committed to and more steeped in carnism. Why do you think veganism will replace the, the carnist ideology? Carnism is following the trajectory of other oppressive isms that are now beginning to destabilize and topple you know, sexism and racism and other isms. It's obviously not the same as these isms, but it's following the same trajectory. When a behavior becomes a choice, it takes on an ethical dimension that it didn't have in quite the same way before. And people start to question. Um, when a behavior seems like a necessity and the public is brainwashed into thinking we have to kill these others for the survival of the race or the species, people follow along with the dictates of that ideology. But once it becomes clear that it's not a necessity to engage in a behavior that is counter to people's core values, this behavior takes on a whole new ethical dimension. And this is what we can see happening with veganism today. More and more people are unable to continue justifying eating animals as a necessity. Have there been any events recently that, that really give you hope for the movement? There have been quite a few. I'm trying to, I mean, I travel a lot. So yeah, I, I mean, just going to veg festivals in places like Malaysia three years ago, I was in Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia and they had a veg festival and it was, it was packed. And a lot of the people there were not vegan or vegetarian and were extremely open and receptive. Um, I gave talks through Korea. Um, South Korea. My book came out in Korean. It was the second, uh, the first foreign language it came out in. And all of the talks were packed and um, almost 100% meat eaters in the audience and tremendously receptive response. And so I've been incredibly heartened to just see that people are more alike than different everywhere I go. And everywhere I go, I see that people genuinely care. They care about animals, they care about justice, they care about the truth, they care about their health, and they care about the environment. And so for vegans, we kind of, in some ways, it's an easy sell. We're advocating, you know, vegan values are all our values. Most people all want the same kind of world we're working for. Why is there so much media misinformation about veganism? You know, carnism, like other dominant systems, keeps itself alive by doing two things. It needs to validate itself and invalidate the counter system that challenges it, which is veganism. And so carnism uses two sets of defenses. It uses defenses that teach us to believe that eating animals is the right thing to do. It's normal, natural, and necessary. And it also uses a set of defenses to make us believe that, um, a set of myths to make us believe that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. And one of the ways that it does this is by creating a mythology around vegans themselves. Um, you know, carnism conditions all of us to believe that the people who are bringing us information that would help us step outside of the carnistic box that we're stuck in are not on our side. It, it conditions people to resist the information that vegans bring. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about vegans simply because there aren't many vegans in the world and there's not a lot known and understood about vegans' experience. Um, and also because the dominant system, that is carnism, conditions us to have distorted perceptions of anybody who challenges that 
that system. I mean, this is what happened to feminists who were, you know, the suffragists who were fighting for the women's right to vote. They were seen as hysterical, anti-males, you know, and feminists have been seen as bra-burning man-haters. Um, it's a way of shooting the messenger. If you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. Do you think in the future, people will be called carnists and vegans won't really be called vegans? I think, um, I personally don't use the term carnist to label people. Um, I use it as an adjective. I, I do think that food will be labeled carnistic um, ver rather than vegan. I have, from what I've seen in my experience and from what I understand and, uh, you know, as a, as a psychologist who's studied social transformation, it seems very clear to me that uh, veganism will replace carnism as the dominant ideology one day. It's the, the question is not whether, but when, and part of the process of getting there will probably be foods being labeled with a C instead of a V. Do you have any like general quick tips for, for vegans struggling in relationships or for vegans that aren't really that effective in their activism? Yeah, so often what happens is that vegans and non-vegans get caught up in arguments about the content. Um, the content is the, of a conversation is the what, you know, whether to have animal products in the house or not, where to go for dinner, you know, whether to have the... Thanksgiving turkey on the table or not. And these are important conversations to have, no question. Um, and at the same time, underneath the difference in beliefs, underneath the content is the process. That's the how we communicate about these issues. Underneath veganism and carnism is a relationship between people. And that's where the attention needs to go when talking about any kind of issues, especially difficult issues where people really have a, a difference of opinion. And so, if, um, you know, one of the ways to have a healthy process is to be committed to being a compassionate witness to the other, both parties, to being committed to listening openly with compassion and empathy and to the best of your ability without judgment, to refraining from, you know, to refrain from being uh, judgmental and shaming of one another. Now, when it comes to vegans and non-vegans in relationships, the playing field is not level. Vegans are members of a non-dominant social group. Vegans are, you know, move through the world with their experience largely misunderstood. There are a lot of stereotypes about vegans that shape non-vegans' perceptions of vegans and can get in the way of relationships. So it's especially, it's important for both people to witness each other, and it's especially important for the non-vegan in the vegan's life to be willing to look at the world through the vegan's eyes. Vegans, you know, asking somebody else to become vegan who's close in your life is challenging. What vegans can do, and I believe need to do, is to ask the people in their lives to learn about veganism, not to convert them to veganism, but so that those other people can understand the vegan. It's impossible to have a connected, secure relationship if we don't understand each other's worlds. And so one of the things that I, I write about in my book is um, how to ask the people in your life to be an ally to you, to be a vegan ally, to be willing to understand your beliefs, your values, your motivations enough so that they can support you in that, even if they haven't chosen that same lifestyle. And lastly, what does the future hold for Dr. Melanie Joy? Yeah, well, once Beyond Beliefs is published and launched, then we'll make some decisions about what the next steps are around the book. Um, we'd like to be offering more vegan support. We're going to be expanding SIVA to have an online learning platform um, so that we can reach thousands of vegans instead of just hundreds of vegans at a time. Um, and really um, just broaden our support for vegans. You know, more and more people are becoming vegan today. And I think the movement does a good job. Of, of, of bringing people into it um, and we could do a better job of putting support together so that vegans um, feel like they have the support and the connections they need to be sustainably vegan and to be effectively vegan. So that's really what we want to be focusing on more.